All right, everyone. So welcome to 50.S50, Poker Theory and Analytics. So this is going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 3.30 to 5. Um, I just got uh, a room for a review session on Tuesday, Thursday for anyone who needs to catch up a little bit. The class is here, 4.370. Um, I'm Kevin Desmond. I'm going to be the instructor. Paul Mende is a faculty advisor. And this is worth um, three, three H credits. The gameplay aspect, so this is what I did. And I think this is, I think this is really cool. So ProgerStars gave us our own private league for only MIT people in this course. And my goal here is to separate um, people who are like fairly new from people who are very competitive. Because I, I don't want, I don't want someone not to pass the course because they happen to be not that great at poker. So I created this thing called the Beginner's League. And these are going to be daily turbos. Turbos means like they're fast-ish tournaments. And to get the gameplay credit, you can cash, you can make money in one of them, or you can play in 10 of them. So those who are struggling can get this gameplay credit by playing 10 tournaments, which is about like a 10-hour commitment. Let's go into the gameplay aspect more. So PokerStars created this private league for us, which is really cool. So PokerStars is, is generally considered like the most reputable online poker site. That's why we use them. So they have two different types of games. So they have real money and play money games. Now, um, if you're in the US, you can't do real money. Like that, it used to be something that was very gray area. Um, it became, and then there was one poker site which turned out to be like legitimately uh, like a Ponzi scheme and as a result, um, now poker in, in the US is like much more black and white, definitely not okay for real money. However, their play money scene is, is pretty resilient and that's what we're taking advantage of here. The poker stars play money scene is broken down into two different things. They have like public games where you can just go and play for like play chips in, uh, against anyone in the world, which is cool and you can do that. Like, and I recommend you give it a shot just to get used to the software. Um, in addition, you can do home games, which is what we're generally gonna be doing. That's what they call their like private leagues. Um, so the private, in the private leagues, in like their home games, they have this showcase. And you might notice as soon as you log in that the MIT league, Poker Theory and Analytics, is already at the top. That's not just for us, that's for everyone. Anyone in the world who logs into PokerStars and looks at home games has the MIT League at the top, which I think is really cool. So to access this, I'll send out more specific instructions later. I gave you guys the, um, just like the passcode of what you need, but to actually get there, what you need to do is, you log into PokerStars, you go to like this button, which is a little house, to access the home games, and then you wanna join a game. And what you do is, you put the club ID, which is 557832, you put the invitation code, which you're all gonna have on Stellar, and then you put your real name, preferably the one that's listed in the course, because I actually have to approve everyone that joins the league, and I can't do it just based on someone's screen name. And I guess you have to agree to some sort of terms and conditions. So let's talk about hand histories. So a lot of the analytics are gonna be based off of um, hand histories, which are just text files that PokerStars gives you um, to the extent that you, um, you indicate that you wanna save them down. So these are like kind of jumbled messes of text. Each line is just one thing that happens and you, you might get used to reading it or, or might not depending on um, how much you're gonna scrutinize it. But more importantly, you can use these in all the data analytic um, programs that we're gonna use. Like in particular, like Poker Tracker runs off of that. You'll, you'll load a, um, just thousands of hands into Poker Tracker and it'll do analytics for you. Like it knows exactly what's going on based on that format, which is generally considered universal. And then um, for the sake of visualizing these hands, like if you just read it, that's fine. But then if you wanna show other people, um, I'm recommending we use something called the Universal Hand History Replayer, which is something that's free. And what it does, it just reads the hands and it plays them. Um, it animates what happened as if you were seeing it for real. So the deal with hand histories is if you're a real money player, PokerStars like dedicates um, databases of hand histories so that um, if you want, you can request all your hand histories at any time. Um, for play money players, they let you capture your own hand histories if you want, 
but they definitely don't save them. So the reason I'm showing you this now and I'm going to email it out to you later is if you lose your hand history so you don't capture them in time, you'll never get them back. So make sure you're actually capturing hand histories um, because we're gonna be using that for a lot of the analysis we do. Okay, so let's talk about the league. And honestly, I think like this league is going to be really cool. Usually the 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 evolution of a player is like they're terrible at poker and then they start becoming good at playing against bad people and then when they actually start playing for real they get crushed again because they're used to playing against other bad people so this will actually um hopefully get you used to playing against other people who are playing correctly which is not something um you can commonly learn just from um from like playing around with your friends um, in addition, you can, through playing in these online leagues, you can collect stats that you could never get from playing live. And I think this is, like, the, this is why the, tourna like, the live tournament scene is dominated by online pros. It's because no, like, no live pro can get as many hands or analyze their play in the way that you can do online. There's just, it's not even comparable. So this is given, even if your, your whole intention is to only play um, live the entire rest of your life, doing this type of analytics would give you a chance to learn at a much faster rate and learn things that you would never see live. So every week, we're going to have uh, a major tournament which is basically gonna be the same structure, maybe a little bit slower than the ones we do daily, except they're gonna have real prizes. So Akuna is giving us, for their first tournament, Beats headphones, an Apple TV, both speakers, and a lot of gift cards. And then for their second tournament, they're giving us all of those things, plus an iPad Air and an iPad mini. But we're not done yet. <laughs> because this class is focused on playing live, we're going to end the class with a live tournament sponsored by Optiver on the 31st, which is the day after the last day of the class. So after the league's over and after you guys are good at poker, like you'll have an opportunity to play each other in a live tournament where their prize pool is all of the Akuna prizes <laughs> plus a PlayStation 4 plus an iPad, plus a Kindle, and plus a GoPro. I, I want this to reflect what, the, what um, the type of things like an online multi-table tournament player would do. How it normally works is during the week, and basically every single day, there's a uniform amount of tournaments that will just run every single day at, like, at the top of the hour. And these pros will just grind those out. They'll get used to the structure, and that's where, where, um, where they'll kind of like grind their teeth. And then on the weekends, that's when you get a lot of the like um, a lot of the square money, a lot of the like um, the newer guys who only play poker on the weekend. And those are more gimmicky, like idiosyncratic tournaments, but also the highest value. So that's why I'm producing the, the tournament structure like this, where the bulk of your tournaments will be very similar to each other, but then the tournaments that really matter will be completely different, at least relatively different. So that's why I'm doing that. That's, that will make you get a feel for what these guys have to go through. Um, so let's talk about turbos. Turbos let you focus on pre-flop decisions, which... Um, are the area where I think there's the most to learn among people who are new at poker. Um, by basically the like all of your value that you're losing in tournament is from screwing up preflop. Like no one gets that right live because it's really difficult to to be able to to um, like feel comfortable doing which is generally considered right. And we're going to spend a lot of time on preflop, but these turbos encourage you to do that sort of thing because live is a lot of preflop and that you're gonna be doing that in the turbos online too. Um, in addition, no one wants to spend like six hours doing a tournament. So I'm making these turbos so you can be in and out in like 45 minutes. And then you can like boot up another tournament or you can like be done with poker for that night. Um, in addition, you, you have the opportunity, you can play as many tournaments as you want. Like it, it's common for a pros to do something called multi-tabling, which is they'll do multiple like tournaments at the same time. Like, if you want, you can do, for the beginners, I probably recommend you just do one. 
but for the regular league, like have at it. If you want to do like all four tournaments at the same time, like go ahead to the extent that they're, they overlap with each other a little bit. Um, okay, so that's the end with the prize league. So the schedule is, uh, we're gonna go through what, what I'm calling basic strategy, which are like the, the basic axioms that we're gonna be using to, um, in order to analyze the decision-making process in poker. Um, then we're gonna be doing pre-flop analysis, and we're gonna be doing a lot of this because this is really like, a, this is where the value add is gonna be, is getting this right. I think the way that we can um, tackle this thing it is kind of a way I recommend that you learn anything complicated. So um, we, we're gonna break this down into three different sections, like fundamental concepts, practice, which are actually implementing those concepts when, like, when you have 10 seconds to make a decision, and then more advanced stuff. Um, okay, so with regard to concepts, um, I'm going to call this like the basic framework for decision making. It's like being unexploitable. Like you want to get to the level when you sit down at a table, every pro in the room doesn't turn and go, I want to sit at that guy's table. You want to be a slightly winning player way before you want to become like a huge winning player. In, in order to let you know the type of thing that we're learning, I'm going to label the slides with this to indicate that this is like a basic concept learn this thing before you move on. Um, the advanced stuff is once you, once you learned how to do things, which is like how to do things is pretty, is pretty broad. We're gonna learn like minor adjustments that we can do to get um, quite a bit of extra money. Like how to grind out that, that additional like half big blind an hour out of, out of our opponents. Um, so any, any real deviations from what we normal do, normally do. Uh, in addition to metagame, metagame is always fun. Like anything not related to the hand-to-hand -hand, uh, decision-making process, like table selection or like bankroll management or like deciding whether or not to play. Like that stuff is really fun. And that's going to be indicated by this ace here. Okay, so I'm going to label those sides for anything that's uh, considered advanced and stuff you should only really do when you get the concepts down. And then a lot of this class is going to be focused on uh, practice, which is how to actually implement, like how to implement these concepts on a uh, on a day to day basis when you're actually playing. So especially live, like we are not going to have all the information, we're not going to have like calculators, and we're not going to have that much time to make a decision. Um, so how to like apply these in real time? Making rules of thumb, figuring out what you can just ignore and what you have to definitely do, and then some of the psychology stuff related to actually performing live is going to be what I'm calling practice, which is uh, going to be indicated that by that poker chip with a P in it. All right, anyway, so let's um, let, let's talk about the what, what I'm bringing to the table here. So. Um, so th this course is primarily going to be from my perspective, and um, the the decisions about what I'm, um, I, I guess what what I'm going to teach you here, and like the like value calls I'm making is going to come from what I consider the the appropriate way for someone to play poker. Like so, my my background is that I was an online like multi table tournament grinder not because like I was a great pro, but because like I sat more than I played. Like I was definitely a person who did not play every single tournament. Like the, um, I told you like the World Series of Poker has like 25 different tournaments, like 10 or Texas Hold'em. And then they have like, like an Omaha tournament and like a horse tournament, which is a combination of five different games. And what is common is that any like pro who plays one plays them all. Like, I consider that like ridiculous for someone who's actually interested in making like any sort of money or career playing poker. So uh, I'm definitely someone who likes uh, who prefers identifying value and like monetizing it. So anyway, so so that's the perspective that I'm going to be teaching this course from. Like I like ROI. Like it's a great like efficiency metric. Um, I'm going to give some usually. Like you try to maximize your ROI up until the point where it's below some sort of hourly that you set for yourself. Um, 
because one of the ways you supplement ROI is by moving down in stakes. Like usually lower stakes are easier games, so you should have a higher win rate. But that win rate's multiplied by um, a much lower number. So usually you're gonna move around in stakes until you like have a good ROI, but it's hopefully above what you consider your lowest amount that you can uh, that you can feel comfortable earning. In addition, I wanna focus on live tournaments because who knows what's gonna to happen to online. Um, whereas I think live tournaments are very social, they're very, like they're very public, everyone knows who, who wins live tournaments. So I'm gonna teach uh, in a way such that focuses on these types of values. Um, okay, so let's move on to, let's move on to some of the, the concepts and tools that we're gonna learn. So we're, we're done learning about uh, we're done learning about what we're actually going to be doing during this class. So let's learn a little bit about poker. So first thing is, we're going to be using Poker Tracker for a lot. So I'm going to email out exactly how to install this thing. Uh, poker Tracker has donated 115 licenses to their product for us. And then our next lesson um, on Wednesday is going to be Joel Fried uh, teaching us how to use this thing and going through some of the analytics. Okay, so one other thing that I like using is a universal replayer. And what this thing does is it just visualizes hand histories. So you'll feed it a hand history um, in a text file. It animates it. It probably does other things, but it's free. And uh, this thing's been around for a while. I I'm not even sure if it's supported anymore, but it's a thing that I'm used to. So this is what it looks like. Just you, you give it a hand, and then it reproduces what like you might have seen if you actually played that hand. Um, so let, let's move on to a concept, so stack size. So th this might seem fairly simple, but um, we ought to make sure we're talking about the same thing when we go through this. So um, your stack size, are, it's the value of the chips in front of you. So that's fairly normal. <clears throat> but we have this thing called effective stack size, which is what we're usually gonna be talking about when we refer to stack, which is the minimum of like your stack or the next biggest stack after you. And the way to think about this is the number of chips you could possibly lose in this one hand. That's what your, your relevant stack size is. And the, the way you make decisions will depend on your effective stack much more than anything else. So, so an example of this would be, say you're in a, um, say you're in a heads up situation where you're the, you're the, you're the hero here in the small blind, right? Big blind has whatever, 300 chips. And you have, you have some amount of chips with queens, all right? So if you have, so if you have 1,500 chips, and so does he, say blinds are like, uh, are 1020. You have, what, like 50 times the, uh, the blinds combined here? So this is a pretty different hand than aces. Why? So say that you, you raise with queens and then he raises you. Okay, so you raise to like 60, he raises you to 200, you raise to 600 and he pushes to 1500. Like your queens are probably not really that good anymore. Like it matters how many chips you have here. However, if you have, if you have 300 chips, you raise with queens and then he pushes over, you can't fold that. Like you might as well have aces and it makes your hands, like the way you play hands materially different. That's why chip size matters in general. When like the chip stack is low, you're playing these two hands basically identical. It, you're saying like, you're just playing this range. However, when we're talking about effective st chip stack, it's the same thing where even if you have 1,500 and he has 300, if you raise, he's gonna push, you don't have the opportunity to do that back and forth anymore. So you might as well have 300 uh, with regard to your decision making here. That's why we're looking at the effective stack because it really matters who has the least number of chips because that determines when the action's gonna be over. Um, so really, like I like this definition the most, the most amount of chips that you can lose in the hand. 
it's a it's a lot more um, I think simple to think about than this like min formula. Um, okay, and then we're almost always talking about effective stack. Let's talk about Dan Harrington. So Dan Harrington is um, is is a player who whose style I, I very much like. Um, his nickname's Action Dan, which um, the consensus is he just kind of gave himself because he's considered like Mr. Fundamental, like tight, aggressive, ABC player. So th this like playing style, this temperament, uh, tight, aggressive, it is something that um, it is something that is used to characterize like basic playing styles. So let's quickly go through what those are. So there are two different axes here. There's um, how often you bet, where a bet means like you are raising the stake, so either you bet or you raise, and then here is how often you call. Either you call a lot or you call not that much. You can get a good feel for the type of uh, person someone is by what box they, they fill in. Um, so these have names. So someone who's tight aggressive, you would just refer to them as tag, which is like what Dan Harrington is. Like you, you bet when you have good hands and you fold when you have bad hands. Um, Another like possibly winning strategy is loose aggressive lag, where you certainly bet when you have good hands, but you will see a lot of cards before you'll give up on a hand. Like you're definitely willing to call a lot. Um, these um, tight passive are not pronounceable words, so they they the community generally came up with different words to describe these. Um, <laughs> so a tight passive person is weak. Like, they're someone who you can completely run over because they fold when they have a bad hand, they check when they have a good hand. Like, they, they're like, I guess it'd be called like rocks. Like, you're, you never need to worry about having a big losing night against these guys. So someone who's tight passive is generally considered playing suboptimally. And then the loose passive people um, are described via this icon, which I, I forget what it's from. I think it might be from an old version of, of like Poker Tracker or um, maybe it was like on Party Poker or something, but everyone loved seeing this icon, which you could label people as, because a loose passive person is what? They are a calling machine. <laughs> That's what that stands for, and it means that when you have a hand, they will call all of your bets. You will extract value out of them. But when they have a hand, they're, they're okay with letting you look at your draws to make a decision about whether like, by the river you have a hand or not. Like they are, there's virtually no way that these guys are making money in poker. Like I think it would be, like over a realistic sample size, there's no type of player who could fit in this quadrant and be good enough on any other metric to actually be making money in poker. Um, so in, in general, how we look at this is, we, like we, we would call this tag guy, like solid ABC, like that's what I'm recommending you guys play as. Um, you can, like, Tag players, like as a as a quadrant, are going to be the biggest winners. Lag players, someone who's very aggressive and plays a lot of hands, could possibly be a pretty good winner. Um, it depends on it depends on the type of game and then like their opponent and their ability to pick spots. But there are a lot of big lag winners. There are not a lot of big um, weak winners, and there are not a lot of calling machines, loose passive players who are not big losers. So anytime you see, like, this is the definition of someone who's a complete fish, like a huge donator to the game. And your, your ability to recognize this type of thing will help you find, like, good games to play when you see someone doing this kind of thing. Um, anyway, back to Action Dan. So um, Dan Harrington is, is a pretty, uh, like, pretty good poker player. He's been around the block. He, he won the main event back in 1995 when it had like 300 people in it. He has two World Series of Poker bracelets and um, one World Poker Tour title. But anyway, so, so Harrington popularized this thing called the M-Ratio, which was invented by someone else. 
So the M ratio was invented by this guy, Paul McGrill, who is a backgammon theorist. Apparently one of the best backgammon players in the world, commentator for the WSOB, World Series of Backgammon, um, and eight WSOP uh, final tables. Anyway, so he's supposedly really, really good at math, even by like MIT standards. Uh, but he invented this thing called the M ratio, but then it never caught on until Harrington started doing it. All right, so Harrington's M ratio um, is your effective stack divided by the sum of the blinds and the antes. So you'll, you'll hear people talk about like, oh, I had 10 big blinds or like 15 big blinds or whatever to talk about their chip stack. But that has the fundamental problem of, um, it, it has a lot of different problems. One is it doesn't, um, it doesn't tell the story of, so blinds, so you, the usual blind levels are like um, one, two, or two, four, where the big blind is just twice the small blind. So that's like the assumption. But if you're at a blind level that's like one, three, and then like, or three, five, the number of big blinds you have is not indicative of, of anything. It's not indicative of like how many hands you can see or like how much you care about winning a pot pre-flop. So using big blinds is bad. In addition to, once you start having like, if you're 50, 100 blinds and you have an ante of like 25, like you're, you have basically half the stack that you had before in realistic terms. Just to get big blinds doesn't factor in antes at, uh, antes at all. And that's a major problem referring to it like that. Um, so um, using M seems to make a lot more sense. So what it is is it's basically the like percentage of your of your stack that is the blinds and the antes. So it's like how many rounds of poker you can survive if you just fold every single hand. Um, of course, you're not going to do that. Although I think that's what he's actually getting at because he uses M to refer to when you have to make a move, which is not generally how I recommend you do it. I think it's more important because it means how important the blinds are to your stack. So. The, see, the only reason anyone plays any hand of poker is because someone wants to win the blinds. Like even, if you, like, even if you have kings, you're like, to some extent, if you could win the blinds, like 99% of the time, you would just do that. You don't really, like, all the time want someone to, to go up against you. So the blinds are really driving the decision-making process, at least, the, at least pre-flop. And like the percentage that those blinds are of your stack matter a lot. If they're like, if they're 1% of your stack, if your M is 100, the blinds basically don't matter at all. Like the, whatever happens after the blinds is gonna materially impact your decision. Or if your M is two and the blinds are half your stack, like winning those seems really important. You should do whatever you can to kind of maximize your chance of winning that. So that, that's why M is, uh, is a good ratio here. Um, and then in addition for tournaments, it makes it much easier to talk about um, hands without having to worry about all the like different parts of the tournament life cycle. Like if you have 1,500 chips and it's 100, it's 50, 100 blinds, you can basically make the same decisions as if you have 10 times as many chips at a level that's 10 times as, uh, as high blinds. You don't need to like, you can just divide in your head and basically make the same decision. You don't need to worry about doing anything different as a result of having more chips. So Harrington invented, uh, invented or brought up a bunch of other things that no one even, uh, that never really caught on. He invented this thing called the Q ratio, which is your stack size divided by the average stack size uh, in the tournament. So I, I guess you might use this to get an idea of like how far behind you are in the tournament. Like if, you're, if your Q is five, you don't need to be that aggressive, but if your Q is 0 0.2, like, you have a lot of catching up to do before you're realistically going to be <clears throat> anywhere near the money. Like, I don't really make decisions based on that. I think the community doesn't. So, like, it, it never really caught on for anything. I've never actually heard anyone use that. Um, so he came up with this thing called effective M, which is more, which makes sense if you look at M from his perspective. Effective M, it, it's your M divided by... Um, you, you multiply it by how short stacked your table, or how short handed your table is. And it gives you the equivalent of the number of 10 handed uh, tables you could survive. It just means that, 
say you have 10 M, so you could, you could survive 10 rounds of uh, blinds, but you have three people at your table, you can't survive for another like six hours because you actually pay the blind every other hand. That's what effective M is doing. It, it reduces your M proportionally. Um, since he's looking at this from the perspective of when you need to start making moves, uh, it kind of makes sense that your M would be reduced if you're shorthanded. But uh, I look at M from the perspective of how valuable it is in terms of blinds. Um, so I don't really use that. I don't know anyone who really uses effective M either. Um, but he invented them, and like maybe they'll catch on eventually. So I think that's going to be done for today. Thanks, everyone, for a uh, good first lecture.